Recording started. weekend of maintenance planned on Metro with the fact that you cannot take Metro and get by rail to Reagan National Airport. Traveling around the region in general, the rains began a couple hours ago, but not with the big puddles yet, but enough road spray certainly to make it tough to see. Please, everybody just turn the headlights on. Bay Bridge, of course, already reduced to just two lanes heading east. However, the line is only long, approaching the tolls on the left, easy pass only lane. Between the beltways on I-95 and the Baltimore Washington Parkway, between 495 and Frederick on 270. So far, that's run without mishap. There was one unexpectedly slow stretch that a couple listeners checked in, but apparently checked out with getting to the front row. North of Spotsylvania, toward the Rappahannock, the area around Fredericksburg. So, unless that's already been resolved, we have yet to figure out what the distraction was on I-95 North. For drivers, for travelers who are planning a longer trip, but get to choose when you leave, I'd sit back and wait until the rush hour begins to taper off. Heavy traffic can be expected at Reagan National Airport. Avoid delays by driving directly to the terminal garages. The parking is free for up to 60 minutes. More information about the construction on the airport grounds at flyreagan.com slash project journey. I'm Bob Marburg, WTV Traffic. Rain showers will continue on into the evening hours, coming to an end between about 9 and 11 p.m. Otherwise cloudy and chilly out there with temperatures today only in the 40s to around 50 degrees. For tonight, our temperatures will fall into the 30s for overnight lows. And tomorrow, with windy conditions, we'll have wind chills in the 30s. I'm Storm Team 4 meteorologist Amelia Draper. And right now, rain all around 48 in Washington. Attention timeshare owners.
going to interface with air transportation. The biggest deal of the day is access to Reagan National Airport. Item first, southbound 395 and uh, exiting to the GW Parkway. And southbound on the GW Parkway coming over the humpback bridge by the Columbia Island Marina with caution. That's where the line forms to get onto the grounds at Reagan National Airport. A couple listeners have checked in with their experience taking upwards of 50 minutes to an hour or more just trying to get to the point at which they could indeed drop passengers off for flights. If somebody is going to go to be part of an air crew, then they're going to need even more time. Now, on 395 from the bridges to the Beltway, on I-95 to the Occoquan and past Garrisonville and Stafford southbound, so far it is volume and the obvious issue of weather. Northbound through Fredericksburg, there have been a crash before the Rappahannock. That was cleared from the way and gone from view. The next crash northbound, north of the exit for Stafford. At about mile post 141 and blocking the right travel lane of three in the northbound direction on 95. Same story around the region on the interstates and the major highways. Volume early on a Friday afternoon. Typical, slow pace the result of the weather. Fortunately, no major type of accidents in which people have gotten seriously hurt. So we're going to try to keep it that way. Headlights on, be seen by the drivers around you, and then watch for the pedestrians, the joggers, the bicyclists, and now the motorized scooters, the passengers of which may be looking at their smartphones. <laughs> to Lowe's November 9th through the 11th, you get 10% off when you use your Lowe's consumer credit card, but it can't be combined with other credit offers. See the store, see the store, or log on to Lowe's.com for more details and exclusions applicable in the U.S. only. Bob Harbour, WTV Traffic. This Friday will be the ninth out of the last 11 Fridays where the area has dealt with some kind of rain. By the end of today, we'll pick up around an inch or less of rain across the region, with rain coming to an end between about 9 and 11 p.m. The weekend is looking dry but cold. Highs tomorrow in the 40s, but wind chills in the 30s, with winds at about 15 to 30 miles an hour throughout the day. A freeze warning is in effect for areas east of I-95 Saturday night into Sunday morning with temperatures below freezing everywhere Sunday morning. I'm Storm Team 4 Meteorologist Amelia Draper. Hey, everybody's getting some kind of rain right now. The temperatures are in that zone where, you know, it, it just feels cold and clammy. It and, does. goes uh, right through you. It sure does. We're at 48 degrees.
justification of his existence. basic virtue, value, and duty. Uh, altruism regards man, in effect, as a sacrificial animal, and the word uh, is uh, coined by Auguste Comte in the 19th century to mean specifically the placing of the interests of others above your own. Mr. Gottheld, when you appeared on the Les Crane show several weeks ago, perhaps uh, over a month ago, um, before the, before you were introduced, Les Crane asked some people in his audience, uh, what do you think of altruism? Are you an altruist? And there were several p people who said yes and s suggested or implied that, that what they meant by altruism was benevolence. That, that, they, that to say they were altruist, altruistic was to say that they were benevolent towards others. Now this is a very prevalent view. And I know it's one you don't hold. I wonder if you would discuss why to be altruistic and to be benevolent is not the same. Uh, yes, of course. To begin with, uh, this is a package deal spread and fostered by the altruist. It is to their own interest to uh, suggest to men uh, that altruism merely means kindness or benevolence or respect for the rights of others, which it does not. In fact, most people, I would venture to say an overwhelming majority, do believe that that is all that altruism means. Uh, so that, in effect, if you give a dime to a beggar, you are an altruist. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Because altruism does not claim that you should help others when and if you can. It specifically claims that you should subordinate your own interests to the interests of others, and therefore that others should take the first place in your life as a moral duty. In that case, kindness is impossible. Uh, if it is your duty to give away your last penny to anyone who might need it, you are giving him his due. In fact, altruists would say it is his right to demand your penny. Uh, therefore, it's not an action of kindness or generosity or charity on your part. It is a moral duty. Altruism, in fact, makes benevolence among men impossible. Because if you have to regard all other men as mortgage holders on your life, if their claims have to supersede any interest of your own, then you can feel nothing but fear and hatred toward other men, since they are a threat to your own existence. And if you do not satisfy their claims, you have to take moral blame for it. You have to consider yourself morally guilty. Uh, that makes any kind of authentic benevolence among men impossible. It entails other contradictions. There is no reason why you should consider the benefit of others as a value if you do not consider your own benefit a value. Uh, altruism demands that you regard everybody as a value except yourself. And remember that this applies to every human being. Therefore, according to an, an altruist, no human being has any right to any value nor to any existence or happiness of his own. He is only has the right and duty to serve others. Therefore, altruism does regard men as sacrificial animals, as object of sacrifice for others. That is not a theory of benevolence for men. There can be no benevolence for men unless one recognizes man's basic right, basic moral and political right to exist for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself to others nor others to himself, which is precisely what altruism denies. Mr. Goodman. Ms. Raymond, why would anyone accept altruism under your definition of altruism? Uh, incidentally, very few people do, but the theoreticians of altruism certainly do accept it. Most people ignore the question and uh, simply try to get by 
in a kind of totally immoral attitude. Most people do not have a consistent moral theory to guide them, a theory which they understand, accept, and fully practice. Uh, but the reasons why they accept altruism are many. The main one is that men realize, so long as they have to make choices, that they need some kind of code of moral values, that is, a code to guide their choices and the sort of values and goals that they will pursue. They realize the need, yet they have not been offered any code of morality other than the altruistic one. In one form or another, altruism has been the dominant moral theory of most societies of history, and such attempts as have been made by philosophers to devise a, a different code of morality have been uh, so impracticable, so unsuccessful that they could not offer competition to altruism. The most people are afraid to be left on their own in moral issues. They are more afraid of it than in any other issue. Men are not afraid to be scientists and to stand alone in the face of nature in cognitive issues, that is, in issues of discovering new knowledge. But they are terrified in issues of values, in having to stand alone and define what objectively is right or wrong for men. That, I would say, is the most general reason why men accept altruism or at least pay lip service to it. But there are many other reasons. One common variant of altruism is the belief that you should give only to those who are less better off than yourself, those who are in need. How do you feel uh, in, in, this is in relation to, to altruism? Well, here I would like uh, really to refer you to Atlas Shrugged because I presented the issue there much better than I could do it impromptu here, but to uh, re repeat just the essence of it. Uh, this, uh, your remark is correct. That is what altruists hold, and the result of it is that it makes need, pain, failure, disaster the leading purpose and value in life. In other words, it amounts to the following situation, which you can see politically coming through today. If a man fails, for any reason, uh, through his own fault or through accidents, uh, in any case, any failure gives him a mortgage on the lives, the earnings, the property, the services of those who have not failed. And therefore, the result is a hierarchy of values of which the zero is the dominant standard. Uh, to the extent to which you lack any value at all, personal or spiritual or material, to that extent, you have a claim on your betters in the particular regard to your failure. To the extent to which a man has achieved values, again, material, spiritual, intellectual, to that extent, he is the sacrificial animal for any zero holder, any man who can present his lack as a claim against the achievement. But wouldn't a person who is a full altruist have to give up his possessions even to someone who is better off than himself? Uh, well, you see, altruism cannot, in fact, be practiced consistently. A man who is a full altruist would have to find a cannibal village and offer himself as a meal, because that would be the only way in which he could make a total sacrifice for the sake of others, deriving nothing in return. A total altruist is in a contradiction every time he eats because uh, that morsel of food may be needed by someone else. Because the altruists get out of it by saying that, well, you should uh, reserve for yourself only the minimum necessary in order to go on serving others. But that in itself is a contradiction. What is that minimum necessary? And the main issue is why should it be that way? Why should the needs of others have a primacy over your own? Uh, this question, incidentally, has never been answered by any philosopher of ethics. And the sole base of mysticism has always, uh, excuse me, of altruism has always been mystical. Namely, uh, the issue of self-sacrifice to others has to be taken on faith. Because no rational justification for it has ever been offered and can, uh, nor can it ever be offered. Is it fair to say that an altruist 
have to replace his own values by the values held by other people. And, then, and if this was followed generally, that there would be nobody able to hold a value of his own? Yes, of course. It has been claimed many times, and this is the base of any collectivist dictatorship, that uh, just as you must sacrifice your material possessions or your effort to others, you must also sacrifice your intellectual integrity, so that if you hold to your own ideas of what you believe is true, that is a selfish action. You must sacrifice your mind to what others believe or want to be true. Therefore, you must always agree with the majority in all issues, because it is selfish to hold out for no better ground than that this is your conviction or the conclusion of your own mind. That, of course, is the basic evil of altruism. It does demand the sacrifice of your mind. Mr. Fox. Miss Rand. What is a man's estimate of himself implicit in the mor morality of altruism and, uh, consequent to that, what are the psychological consequences of trying to accept such an impractical morality as, as altruism? Well, the basic uh, consequence is an almost total lack of self-esteem, or as near to total as a man can come and still remain sane and alive. A man who would accept the theory of altruism necessarily has to regard himself as of no value. It is his self-esteem that he has to renounce in every issue. His self-esteem intellectually, his self-esteem spiritually, his self-esteem in the sense of uh, the desire to make something of his own life, to achieve happiness or to achieve some kind of purpose which he desires. That is what he has to give up. The mere idea of looking at yourself as merely a means to the ends of somebody else, whether it's one other person or the total of mankind, implies lack of self-esteem. That is the start of accepting altruism. And to the extent to which you attempt to practice, uh, you would have to destroy your self-esteem more and more. Now what most people do is that they abandon morality. They then decide that nobody can be perfect and that we'll sort of model as best we can. Uh, I will not attempt to be a perfect altruist, but I will feel guilty and give to others once in a while, which really means an amoral kind of existence, the destruction of any firm uh, principles of morality and any firm base of self-esteem. Isn't just the holding of an altruist value a selfish action since he's holding a conviction of his own? Uh, no, here you are mixing uh, two categories. You are really guilty of an uh, equivocation. Uh, what you are uh, asking here is known as psychological egoism, in effect. That is, the theory is that since a man has to act, and he cannot act without willing a certain kind of action, uh, anything he does is necessarily selfish because he chose to do it. That is not the standard of selfishness. This merely means a motivated action. But a motivated action is not necessarily a selfish one. Uh, a selfish action, in the proper sense of the word, is an action consciously aimed at your own rational self-interest. In order to take a selfish action, you have to demonstrate logically why that action suits your own purposes, what it accomplishes for you. That would be properly a selfish action. But a mere desire, the mere fact that you want to do a certain action does not yet make it selfish. And most people, in fact, spend their life taking self-destructive action, which they do want to take. As observe any neurotic who is bound on self-destruction, yet he is acting on his whims, on his emotions on his uh, subconscious irrational urges. That is not the definition of an action. Uh, emotions are not tools of cognition, nor are they tools of uh, moral criterion. The fact that a man wants to do something does not yet tell us what kind of action it is, whether uh, it is or, uh, or is not, in fact, for his own benefit, for his own proper benefit. Mr. Goodman. Ms. Rand, the choice that an altruist offers is either being selfless, sacrificing yourself. Others, or selfish, 
sacrificing others to yourself. Is there any third choice? Well, you see, it's a false dichotomy right here because the assumption behind uh, that dichotomy is that man's interests clash, that the good of one man has to be achieved at the price of the suffering or destruction of another, and therefore it's only an issue of whom you sacrifice. Uh, this means, as I have said before, that uh, altruists offer you a choice between sadism and masochism. Either you torture others or you torture yourself. But it is the metaphysical view of man's position in the world that here has to be challenged. And it is the base of altruism that man exists in a kind of malevolent universe where he is constantly threatened with destruction and disaster, that man is in effect uh, a doomed animal and that his main concern has to be the avoidance of the doom, the avoidance of disaster, not the achievement of values. And if on this premise, uh, then one has to live, you know, I, would, I was going to say like an animal, but that would be an in, uh, insult to animals because they do not live that way. One would have to live by eating others or turning oneself over to, for cannibals to eat. It is not true that one's own happiness or benefit can be achieved by the sacrifice of others. Uh, the idea that selfishness consists of sacrificing others is only a psychological confession of the altruist. They believe that one can achieve one's own benefit by the sacrifice of others, but in fact, and in reality, one cannot. And the legitimate, rational interests of men do not clash and no legitimate rational interest can be achieved by infringing the rights or sacrificing the interests of another man. But here I underscore rational interests, which are not to be determined by mere emotions, wishes, or whims. The fact that a man wants something does not constitute a legitimate rational interest. Mr. Fox. Ms. Ryan, pursuant to the questions I asked before, I would like to know uh, what consequences, if any, are there to a man's conceptual abilities in fields other than morality or uh, philosophy uh, if he tries to practice, uh, to whatever degree, the morality of altruism? What do you mean here? Do you mean in such fields as economic, for instance? Uh, in in, in any, any field, any other field of endeavor, does this in any way uh, warp or destroy his, his ability to think, since yes, this does course. involve the evasions? It, it does, of course, because it robs him of incentive and it places him in contradictions. A man cannot uh, do any kind of work intellectually in any realm if his basic standard is what do others want of me and in what way can I serve them. Uh, in the broadest sense, if you accepted that premise, you could not possibly have any sort of progress in a human society. Because the moment a man, let us say, saved a bushel of potatoes from his uh, harvest, instead of investing it in a largest, larger harvest next year, he would have to give it away to those incompetent neighbors who were unable to grow their own potatoes or more often unwilling. Because the unable is a very marginal issue in human life and a very small number of people. Predominantly, the issue of need is an issue of unwillingness. Uh, unwillingness to carry your own weight or the desire for the unearned, the desire to get an unearned share of somebody else's effort. Therefore, a man who would accept that premise would never be able to rise above the lowest, morally and intellectually, the lowest elements in the population. He would be constantly have to be concerned with sacrificing himself to them. Well, not only would it be disastrous uh, existentially in the sense of stagnation, but it also would be disastrous psychologically. A man could not function on that premise for very long. He would destroy his psychological efficacy for lack of incentive and for being caught in an impossible contradiction. Mr. Gotthelf. <laughs> Many people today, after 20, 30, or 40 years of living by the current popular morality find, them, find that they get the most pleasure or happiness in a comfortable relationship with others. By that I mean if they're with people who are generally nice to them, who uh, approve of what they're doing and so on. And 
at this point, the altruist steps in and says, well, you see, follow that up. Uh, make others your primary concern, and that's the way you'll achieve happiness and pleasure. Now, uh, would you comment on that? Well, to begin with, whether people feel comfortable in a certain position or not, is not a moral criterion. I'm sure that cannibals feel very happy and comfortable after eating a meal, but that would not be ground to say, uh, you see, this is how happiness is achieved, so follow that example. The mere fact that people uh, feel comfortable in a certain state is irrelevant to the issue of whether that state is moral or immoral, proper or improper to man. Those questions have to be answered cognitively, not emotionally. <coughs> More than that, the fact that men want to have a decent relationship with others or enjoy the company of others is not a proof that man is fundamentally a, a hurt animal or a social animal and that his relationship with others are the primary in his existence which should then rule his personal view of himself and of morality. A social relationship necessarily are a consequence of your own premises and values, not a primary, because who is a society? It is only a number of individual men. And you will find, uh, theoretically and historically, that only to the extent to which men recognize and function on the premise of their own individual selfish rights and their own pursuit of happiness are they fit to live in society. Only on that basis can they have benevolent, friendly, cooperative relationship with others. Uh, but on the collectivist, altruist premise, on the premise of placing the interests of the group first, you not only do not achieve your own happiness, but you achieve the destruction of yourself and of the group. Incidentally, there's one journalistic issue that I would like to mention here. Uh, just recently, the New York Times published a survey of the prevalence of dope. taking dope among teenagers and their inquiry concerned predominantly uh, children of well-to-do families. This was not an issue of the evil influence of the slums as the humanitarians always hold. This was an issue of what is happening among the well-to-do people today, youngsters in their teens, college students included. And what they found was a shockingly overwhelming number of cases uh, in fact, uh, the implication was almost that that's the exclusive reason, showing that uh, young people start taking dope for social reasons, because this is the fashionable thing to do, and they want to be in, they want to belong to the group, they are considered squares or outsiders if they do not join, and that desire to conform in all the cases cited was the dominant reason of why. Uh, young teenagers acquired the dope habit. Now I think this is an extreme but very eloquent illustration of what placing the group first would do. I wonder how many people reading that story realize that the training, the education given to young people today, the stress on belonging, on getting along with others, is responsible for this kind of consequence because it's a logical consequence. If you're going to place the group First, uh, you are going to accept anything which the group does. And the leaders of such a group will not be able to arrive at any rational standards either. The result will be some such group standard as taking dope, the extreme eloquent example of self-destruction. Mr. Gahel, people who find that they can't get pleasure out of certain productive activities or out of the major productive activities in their life, would this, could this be due to 
having accepted the altruist view in any way? Uh, not necessarily. People who enjoy productive activity... Or who don't enjoy. Oh, who don't enjoy. enjoy. Oh, yes. Who don't enjoy, uh, uh, the idea of altruism can very much be responsible. On two counts. From one hand, the idea of independent achievement is so much frowned upon, so denounced in the altruist morality that it would discourage uh, a man, particularly if his own ideas are not too firmly formed, it would discourage him from seeking such a career. More than that, the uh, knowledge that he will be denounced and considered guilty if he succeeds, that also will discourage him. And furthermore, and most important, is the fact that he will feel somebody will take care of him. It is not necessary for him to be productive or to take an interest in his own career. Uh, to the extent to which he fails, he will become uh, a first mortgage on the life of everybody else. And that will be an incentive. Without altruism, many people, many more than do today, would realize that there is no escape from the responsibility of carrying your own weight, of providing for your own survival, and of being productive. But what I'd like to add here is another aspect. It is not true that everyone who does enjoy productive work or who is intent on a productive career is necessarily anti-altruistic. You will find there are people who uh, are very productive, function properly in their own field, yet maintain the morality of altruism and are eager to give away a uh, large part, sometimes all, of the result of their productivity, uh, give it up to others who are glad to have dependents, worthless relatives, and various dubious charity causes to support. Yet in one respect, in their career, they are acting on a proper principle. Now ask yourself, why do people like that uh, support altruism? And there's a very important issue here. There are two types of unearned values that you can get. One is the unearned in matter, the result of which uh, leads to simple, plain financial parasite who is supported by somebody else's effort. Much more complex and much more important here is the desire to acquire the unearned in spirit. Uh, after all, productive work is not the only aspect of your life. A man may be very productive, but may be very neurotic, confused, contradictory, or evasive in other aspects of his life. He may lack authentic self-esteem, and he may try to buy it by means of altruistic uh, actions or charity. Uh, a rich man who is uh, a self-made rich man who is anxious to be an altruist and give away his, the product of his effort uh, is after gaining unearned admiration or unearned esteem from others. He is a man who lacks self-esteem and believes, uh, consciously or subconsciously, that he can derive a sense of his personal value from the gratitude, admiration, or praise of others. Uh, that type of man is really psychologically more evil than the plain, uh, crude, uh, material parasites. The men who are after the unearned materially are much less of a threat to mankind than the men who are after the unearned spiritually. Here uh, you get the parasite who either wants power over others, power by force, political power, or social power by means of charity, the admiration of others, the alleged respect, which in fact nobody feels for an altruist of that type, but it helps him with the delusion of maintaining a self-esteem which he uh, does not have and, of course, cannot acquire in that manner. I'm sorry that that's all we'll have time for tonight. I would like to thank our panel, Mr. Jerry Goodman, Norman Fox, and Mr. Alan Gotthelf. And thank you again, Ms. Rang. Thank you. The cat, the environment, and the observer. The observer, by the way, you now know is Hugh Everett who also, by the way, left physics after he got his PhD because he didn't want to take the guff that he was getting. I mean, Wheeler actually sent him to Copenhagen to try to talk to Niels Bohr and the other Copenhagen people, and it was a disaster. It did not go well. 
Uh, so, the story that we told was one where before you, the observer, know the answer to your question, which, which branch of the wave function am I on, the branching has already happened. This process of decoherence in which the cat or the quantum system interacts with its environment is incredibly fast. Numbers like 10 to the minus 20 seconds get thrown around, okay? So no matter how quickly you open the box and look at it, decoherence has happened much before your conscious mind can process the outcome of that particular experiment. And therefore, you always reach a stage that is similar to what we pictured here, where the wave function is already branched. There are now two copies of you, but those two copies are identical. So you could imagine talking to those two copies and saying, well, which branch of the wave function do you think you're on? It turns out to be there's a process. There's a correct way of rationally assigning the probability that you're on one branch of the wave function versus another one. And what it works out to be is that it's the wave function squared. If the amplitude of the wave function for the cat being asleep was the square root of 30%, then you should give yourself a 30% chance of being on the branch of the wave function where the cat is asleep and vice versa. So it works out. The fact that the actual probability rule in quantum mechanics is the probability is the wave function squared is more or less exactly what you would expect if the many worlds interpretation were true. It is not put in as a separate assumption. This is one of the reasons why the Everett interpretation of many worlds interpretation is actually simpler and more compact than the Copenhagen interpretation or anything else. You don't put in things like the probability rule as extra assumptions, you derive them from the formalism. Now the other one, the classical world, this is where I really get excited. Uh, I wish I could talk to you about this for longer, but this is very interesting because we're beginning to understand a way of thinking about the emergence of space-time itself from the rules of quantum mechanics. You may have heard that one of the problems with quantum mechanics is that we can't yet make it compatible with gravity. Right? Einstein invented his general theory of relativity back in 1915. He says that what we think of as gravity is really the curvature of space-time. Isaac Newton would have told you that space and time are fixed and absolute. Einstein tells you that space and time themselves are dynamical. They can change, they can warp, they can move around. This is only one of the four forces of nature that we know about, right? Particle physicists know about electromagnetism, weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force, and gravity. The other three forces, electromagnetism, strong and weak, all have perfectly good quantum mechanical theories behind them. We do not have a perfectly good quantum mechanical theory for gravity quite yet, okay? So, when you dig into it, however, what you realize is that when we say we don't have a good quantum mechanical theory of gravity, what we really mean is we don't have a complete quantum mechanical theory of gravity. When you get to the extremes where gravity is extremely strong, at the center of a black hole, or at the beginning of the universe with the Big Bang, that's what we don't know how to describe quantum mechanics. When we have a relatively benign situation, like here in this room where things fall down if you drop them because of gravity, there we can describe that particular weak force of gravity in perfectly quantum mechanical terms. So here is a way that we can try to make sense of how to do that. Remember, we're going to use, remember I told you about this phenomenon of entanglement, right? That quantum state of two different pieces of reality can be entangled with each other, but if you know something about one, you know something about the other. There's a typical way of thinking about entanglement. It goes back to Einstein, of all people. In 1935, he wrote a paper called the EPR paper, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. And he tried to make, he was just like Schrodinger with his cat, Einstein was trying to make you worry about quantum mechanics. He said, I can have two particles. They can both be spinning, right? Electrons have an intrinsic spin, so when you measure them, they're either spinning clockwise or spinning counterclockwise. And Einstein said, if I have two electrons, because of entanglement, they can be in a state where either they're both spinning clockwise or they're both spinning counterclockwise. There's no possibility that one is spinning clockwise and the other is spinning counterclockwise. That's what entanglement says. But if I ask you, what will I observe when I look at one particle? The answer is I have no idea. The 50-50 chance could be clockwise or counterclockwise. All I know is that the other one is the same. 
So Einstein says, take one of those particles and send them to Alpha Centauri. Put them in a rocket ship. Send them light years away. Okay? And then I observe my particle here. I see, oh, it's clockwise. Instantly, according to the conventional rules of quantum mechanics, the other particle is clockwise also. So Einstein said, this is spooky. This is the origin of the phrase spooky action at a distance. How does the particle far away know that the universe is that we got the result we did for this particle. A many world person says, well, when you observe this particle, the universe branched its wave function, and it branches it all over, and that's not very mysterious. But the point is that this amount of entanglement between the two particles doesn't depend on how far away the particles are, okay? I'm telling you this because if you've heard a little bit about quantum mechanics, you may have heard that. But there's an additional fact that these days, our best theories of the universe are not theories of particles, they're theories of field the electric field, the magnetic field, the gravitational field, even the particles that you know about, neutrinos, electrons, quarks, etc., these are all based on field. And what a particle is, is a vibration in the field. There's, a field. there's many different fields all throughout this room. They're all gently vibrating. If it's vibrating very softly, we don't see anything. If it's vibrating enough, you see a particle there. Those are the rules of quantum field theory. So, while it is true, that two particles can be separated by an enormous distance and still be just as entangled as they ever were, even in empty space, even in between the particles, there are still quantum mechanical field degrees of freedom, as we call them. There's still little vibrating quantum fields, even in empty space. And these are also entangled, and they're entangled in a way that it really does matter how far away they are. Namely, if they're nearby, if you take a region right here and right there, the two vibrating fields are very highly entangled with each other. Whereas if you take two spots very, very far away, they're very unentangled. They're not really related to each other. So that makes sense to us. At least this is how we conventionally think about quantum field theory. Fields are highly entangled when they're nearby, not that entangled when they're far away. So here is the fun suggestion that I could make. What if we invert that? The statement I just made assumes that you know what you mean by nearby and far away, right? Because we're working in a classical space-time where we have rods and clocks and we can measure things. What if we didn't have that? What if we really were truly quantum, nothing but quantum, nothing but a wave function? What we have are different quantum mechanical degrees of freedom that are entangled or not. So what if you say to yourself, when the degrees of freedom are highly entangled, we will define that to be nearby, and when they are unentangled, we will define that to be far away. In other words, you get an emergent notion of geometry, of distances and times, out of the quantum mechanical properties of entanglement. So in other words, well, it's a long story, but here's the punchline, it works. It seems to work, best we can say right now. Rather than starting with space-time, it's a new, exciting perspective on the problem of quantum gravity. Whenever we try in the conventional way of doing things to, to come up with a quantum mechanical theory of something, let's say electromagnetism, we start with the classical theory and we quantize it. The classical theory of electromagnetism was given to us by Maxwell and Faraday and others in the 1800s. There are rules for if you have a classical theory, converting it into a quantum mechanical theory, quantization. But presumably nature doesn't work that way. Nature doesn't start with a classical theory, then quantize it. Nature just is quantum from the start. So maybe the reason why it's been so difficult to quantize gravity is that we shouldn't be quantizing gravity. We shouldn't be starting with the classical theory of general relativity and applying rules to turn it into a quantum theory. Maybe we should be starting with quantum mechanics. Maybe what we should be doing is not quantizing gravity, but finding gravity within quantum mechanics. And the first very tentative, very crude steps in this direction have been taken. And what we find, what we seem to find under assumptions that seem reasonable, is that this emergent geometry that we define from quantum entanglement obeys a, an equation, just like anything should in a good, well-defined physical theory, the equation it obeys is Einstein's equation for general relativity. Einstein's equation is the other equation I want to show you besides Schrodinger's. It's just as much fun, just as impenetrable to understand if you're not an expert. 
but it's not that conceptually hard. On the left-hand side, there's a, a expression, which means how much curvature is there in space-time. On the right-hand side, there's an expression which means how much stuff is there in the universe, how much energy, heat, momentum, and so forth. So this is Einstein's version of the gravitational field between two bodies depends on how far away they are, Newton's law of gravity. This rule governs how the curvature of space-time responds to energy and momentum, and we're able to see that rule emerge from a theory that doesn't even have space-time in it that has nothing but quantum entanglement. So it seems like maybe, if we're optimistic, cross our fingers, by taking the interpretational problems of quantum mechanics seriously, by thinking deeply about what it means to be a quantum state, how it evolves, branching, decoherence, etc., and asking questions about the emergence of the class of the world in that theory, we not only get an answer that explains cats and electrons, but maybe the universe itself. Again, this is very tentative new stuff that might go away, but I think it's a good lesson for how new research directions can be driven by thinking deeply about the hardest problems. So to finish, let me do a, give you a quote from Oxford physicist David Deutsch. He's a big promoter of Everettian or Many Worlds Quantum Mechanics. He says, despite the unrivaled empirical success of quantum theory, the very suggestion that it may be literally true as a description of nature is still greeted with cynicism, incomprehension, and even anger. What he means, of course, by quantum theory is the many worlds version of quantum theory. Quantum theory without anything else, anything besides wave functions and the Schrodinger equation. That theory leads you to believe in a lot of stuff, including multiple branches of the wave function with its many copies of you, and you might not want to believe that. But after my talk, I think, I hope at least, that there is less incomprehension in the room. The cynicism and the anger are up to you. Thank you very much.
people out there who think that marriage is supposed to be easy. Her book is due out next week. Michelle Franz in ABC News, 337. We work hard at being healthier. What? And what we really need is better quality sleep. The new Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed intelligently senses your movements and automatically adjusts your comfort and support on both sides. Your Sleep Number setting. This is not a bed. It's a proven quality sleep. It's time for our Veterans Day set. The Queen Sleep Number 360 C4 Smart Bed is now only $12.99, save $400, plus special financing, only for a limited time. Find your local Sleep Number store at sleepnumber.com. Special financing subject to credit approval. Minimum monthly payments required. See store for details. Attention investors, it's time to diversify to real estate for returns of 20% with monthly payments. Payouts, tax advantages, and 100% of cash flow paid to investors first. National Realty has a proven 11-year track record, $800 million of realty under management, and a new $200 million portfolio. Closing now, backing your investment or IRA with multiple cash-flowing New York City apartment buildings, luxury condos with Hoboken, New Jersey water views, and Delray Beach, Florida oceanfront townhomes. You're backed by Prime Real Estate. These are 20% return financial units. Just call 201-210-2727 now for free information. You're backed by Hard assets in New York, Hoboken, Philadelphia, and Delray Beach, Gulfstream, Florida. Call 201-210-2727 for these 20% return hard asset real estate units for your IRA or cash flow. But they're limited availability. Call now. 201-210-2727. 201-210-2727. An offer to buyers sell any security is only made by our private placement memorandum. Read it first and invest wisely. Best performance is no guarantee of future results. National is a real estate development firm. See us at NRIA.net. Right now, get a new roof for just $99 a month at LongRoofing.com. To Bob in traffic. Widespread weather and a lot of heavy traffic moving very slowly. Incidents along the way on the outer loop in Alexandria. The local lanes, the very beginning of the Wilson Bridge, had one broken down in the center of the roadway. Flares behind it, tow truck had not arrived. Outer loop, beginning of the Wilson Bridge, local lanes. Southbound toward the Beltway on I-295 in the district. Before the exit, the joint base, Anacostia Bowling, the crash initially blocking the right lane. At that point, the right lane of three on I-295. U.S. Route 50 heading eastbound. As the volume gets heavier, the pace gets slower from before the South River. Almost, but not quite continuously to the Bay Bridge. Two lanes toward the shore, but one mile before the Bay Bridge. Must have found the accident blocking the left travel lane of three. I-95 between the Capitol Beltway and 695 the Baltimore Beltway. Responders looking for crash reported to them between the 198 and 216 interchanges. Look ahead for delays. Watch your mirrors. Ahead, north of 32, it's just plain heavy. Continuing toward Baltimore County and the Patapsco River. So far, nothing specifically in the way. Baltimore Washington Parkway keeping expectations low in terms of speeds and volume. The Virginia side heading west on 66. From Roswell to Haymarket, we're back to the Beltway. Currently, no issues reported to block the way from the Pentagon to Woodbridge and Quantico, southbound, or for that matter, in the northbound direction. Southbound, expect heavy traffic running slowly, but each way for the moment. No accidents or spin outs noted. Book your private event or party of 20 or more at Stanford Grill for a memorable celebration. Stanford Grill makes every meal a special occasion. Now with locations in Columbia and Rockville. Bob Marburg, WTV Traffic. More rain and chilly temperatures for the next several hours. Later tonight, the rain will end before midnight as a cold front comes through. It'll turn windy overnight with lows in the mid-30s to low 40s. Partly to mostly sunny skies on Saturday, a windy and a chilly day. Highs only in the mid to upper 40s with wind chills in the 30s. Sunshine on Sunday, the winds will be lighter, but still a chilly day. Highs upper 40s to lower 50s. We'll cloud up on Monday as another storm system comes our way. Highs in the mid 50s. Rainy and chilly on Tuesday with highs only around 50. I'm Storm Team 4, meteorologist Mike Stenerford. Right now, we have a lot of R-A-I-N. It is wet and it's chilly. 48 degrees in northwest. It's 3 4.